A, few, a five minute testimony is not nearly enough time to explain how insidious the story is. Boeing's corporate leaders continue to conceal the truth. They continue to mislead and deceive the public about the safety of the planes. That is the safety culture at the top of the Boeing company right now. The good news is the employees of Boeing and these agencies can overcome poor leadership. We need them to be successful. They're highly capable. They need to be supported and encouraged. And these problems are fixable. But it starts with telling the truth. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Pearson. Uh, Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, Senators. Uh, my name is Joe Jacobson. I'm an aerospace engineer with almost 40 years of experience. I worked for Boeing from 1984 to 1995 on the 767 and 777 programs. From 1995 to 2021, I worked in aircraft certification at the FAA. I retired from the FAA in 2021 and have been volunteering as an independent aviation safety advocate since, mostly in support of the ET-302 families. On November 6, 2018, a week after the Lion Air 610 crash, I received an email from a colleague asking if we had done any issue papers on MCAS. This was the first day that I heard about MCAS. The next day, although not assigned to the crash investigation, I received an email from a colleague at the FAA which contained flight data recorder information from the Lion Air crash. It was immediately obvious to me that the 737 MAX had a serious design flaw. I saw that the horizontal stabilizer was repeatedly moving at a high rate because of a faulty angle of attack input. I guessed that a software error was responsible. A few days later, I was shocked to discover that the airplane was purposely designed and certified to use just one AOA input for this flight critical function. When the House report was released in September of 2020, I finally understood why I hadn't known about MCAS. Boeing meeting minutes from June 2013 recorded the reason, saying, if we emphasize MCAS is a new function, there may be a greater certification and training impact. Boeing intentionally hid the design from FAA engineers and airline pilots. Had we known, at least a half dozen experienced FAA engineers in Seattle, in the Seattle office, would have immediately rejected the original MCAS design. Boeing concealment led to two crashes and 346 deaths. After working on the recertification of the MAX after the second crash, I sent a letter to the parents of Sammy Stumo shortly before my retirement in March of 2021. I saw their anger and grief and wanted them to know the true story and not the false narrative presented by Boeing and FAA. Over the last three years, Sammy's parents have connected me with many other crash families. I frequently communicate with the devastated people who have lost loved ones in the ET-302 crash. I've heard many inspiring stories about those who were lost. Stories about Samia, Mick, Camille, Melvin, Bennett, Danielle, Graziella, and others. The recertification of the MAX has been characterized as the most comprehensive in the history of aviation. This is also a false narrative. During the recertification, of the MAX, FAA leadership supported Boeing's effort to narrow the scope to primarily focus on MCAS. MCAS was a mess for sure, but other critical items were off the re-examination table. The MAX crew alerting system doesn't meet current design requirements, and by my count, the old standard has contributed to eight fatal crashes of Boeing aircraft and 885 deaths since 1996. Despite this dismal safety record, in July 2022, Boeing Chief Safety Officer Mike Delaney stated, I personally have no belief that there's any value in changing the 737. CEO Dave Calhoun lobbied further and said, this is a risk I'm willing to take. If I lose the fight, I lose the fight. Boeing lobbying efforts ultimately succeeded. The grandfathered design of this MAX leaves many vulnerabilities. When combined with a failure to investigate the manufacturing chaos identified nearly six years ago by Ed Pearson, this has led to a predictable but still shocking list of unsafe conditions. 
I've spent almost 40 years studying and trying to eliminate aviation accidents, ignoring problems, taking shortcuts, and deceiving the public just leads to more crashes. I'm testifying today out of my great love and respect for the crash family members that I know. Michael, Nadia, Nisha, Catherine, Ike, Chris, Javier, and others don't want this to happen to anyone else. I also have children and grandchildren. Let's work together to fix this now. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Pearson. Mr. Kuczynski, Professor. Chairman Bartholomew, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm an assistant professor in both Integrated Systems Engineering and the Center for Aviation Studies at The Ohio State University. Prior to teaching at Ohio State, I was an airline pilot. During my time teaching at the university, I earned my PhD in Cognitive Systems Engineering. Although there have been slight variations in the exact definition, one has been of uh, uh, safety culture, one that has been used for years, uh, decades even, are shared beliefs, assumptions, and norms which may govern organizational decision making as well as individual and group attitudes about safety. An incorrect understanding of safety culture is that it is commonly referred to as a single concept, but rather it consists of four individual specific components, whereas each one provides its own unique actions to the overall concept of safety culture. And without one of these, the element and structure of culture will fall apart. As such, each serves the greater goal of providing a robust, effective, and well-proven safety tool for all high-risk industries, especially given its proven value in aerospace industries. It should be made clear this culture concept is not only for airline operations, but rather any aerospace operation where risk of injury or death is a possibility to employees and or customer after product delivery. This is extremely important in determining an organization's overall safety culture as they, are all, as they all complement each other. To be successful, organizations may not simply choose simply one or two of these components because they are less expensive or more manageable. In addition, in aerospace, not following all four components of a safety culture or just the ones that have less impact, thus to appear to regulators or shareholders that they are being responsive finally and expeditious is not acceptable. This type of action will produce a non-viable, misleading, and potentially dangerous safety culture that will teeter on failure and provide a false sense of security. Let me be clear, when you try to increase productivity without the needed resources and being guided by poor management with only financial focus and the lack of assembly line inspectors, you are always borrowing from safety. You cannot have both. And case in point, this is where we see events like the door blowout with Alaska Airlines. NASA learned the hard way many decades ago, and other organizations, aerospace organizations, have as well, with their new plan to operate when they decided they were going to operate faster, better, and cheaper. And it failed horribly. They learned that you can only have two of the three, never all three at the same time, or accidents will happen. When we examine these four components of what constructs a safety culture, it appears that Boeing has none of them under control, and there is no evidence that this trend is, in fact, reversing. This was discussed at the Huntington Beach Conference in February at 2023, which I attended, but there does not appear to be any evidence of such changes to any of the components uh, on the horizon as a string of alarming events continue to unfold. In the safety engineering work, we call these precursors to accidents. And I have never in my decades of aerospace safety work seen so many continuing to arrive one after another. Where is the safety accountability all the way to the CEO where they 
discuss safety in addition to the money problems, all the way to the top. Some of these companies profess to practice, yet never seem to do that. All safety cultures, both uh, those that have and profess to have a good safety culture and SMS programs were developed by DFA and provide guidance how to do that. At Boeing, is there safety accountability all the way to the top? This was discussed after the, the previous accidents, but where's the evidence for that? In closing, you would think that there would have been made clear after having been directly responsible with the two air carrier fatal accidents that at its core causation was 100% about money and about sneaking through the certification process and automation related component, component that killed 346 people over money. And yet we still have no proof that these programs have even entered the lexicon of Boeing. Aircraft, despite the hollow comments to the contrary at the Huntington Beach Safety Conference. So it leaves me to wonder, have we even gone backwards at Boeing? The Alaska Airlines event strongly supports that. My final comments is, is I have always felt as an accident investigator for over 20 years and have always said that with these accidents, maybe the upper management should actually go to these accident scenes and witness what they look like. As, as the rest of us do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Brzezinski. I would be happy to talk to you after this hearing is done. If you, I want to spare you being removed and just tell you that we will be happy to take those documents and meet with you privately. And we welcome your being here. We also welcome the presence of Chris and Clarice Moore, uh, whose daughter Danielle died in the Ethiopia Airlines crash. Uh, they remind us that the seemingly abstract even antiseptic setting of this hearing belies the fact that there are real people who perished in those two crashes. There are real people at risk getting on airlines right now. No reason to panic, but a reason for deep concern. And we thank everyone who may have documents or information to bring to our attention. We thank you. Uh, Professor Brzezinski, what keeps ringing in my ears is that phrase, 100% about money. My understanding of, about what happened here is that Boeing sought to produce more airplanes more quickly without the necessary testing, inspections, and then sought to conceal and cover up what it knew was happening. Is that align with your view of the facts here? Absolutely. That's, that, in fact, is part of it because those things are expensive. And, and, and there's more to it. There, there's other things that go into that process. One of the biggest is the inspectors. Cutting back and getting rid of your inspector um, staff that looks at all the parts to make sure that these things are assembled correctly. We saw this with the accident, with the Alaska accident. One of the lessons here is that shortchanging safety with shortcuts is short-sighted. I want to ask uh, Mr. Salapur, uh, for many of us who may not understand the technology or the mechanics here, uh, my understanding of your testimony is that Boeing, in effect, fastened parts of the fuselage together using force rather than proper shimming and thereby created a severe risk that use over time and fatigue of the parts and fasteners would create risks to safety. Is that roughly correct? Yes, sir. I think they have used, they are using significant excessive force to squash the gaps before you measure it. If you squash in the gap before you measure it, you know, you don't know what you get in because the purpose of that is to measure the gap in its free state. When you squash that with excessive force, 
Basically, you are getting false information. If you get the gap measured falsely, you are not going to shim it properly, and it's a danger to the airplane. It's very, very important. Boeing has put out reports that they say that they can lose almost 80% of the airplane life cycle if we don't follow these protocols, which it is the proper shimming, you know, measuring the gap, you know, debarring. One, one remedy yeah. or one precaution would be proper testing. Has Boeing ever shown you conclusive testing results that would dispel your concern? No, sir. First of all, the testing that we're talking about, I have never seen it, any of the information. The second is the airplane is the king. The numbers that you get from the actual airplanes, regardless of what the testing done, that should be considered. And my data that I was using in my assessment is from the 29 airplane that it was inspected. Mr. Pearson and Mr. Jacobson, you have very extensive experience with Boeing as well as air safety. Do the allegations that Mr. Salapore has brought to our attention surprise you in light of your experience? Well, I just want to say that I can't obviously technically, um, you know, say that what he's saying is absolutely right. I just don't know that. But I will say that the, the, the uh, problem that he's describing where he's trying to uh, get information and he's basically being told, you know, basically shut up, don't worry about it. And you know, he's, he's obviously making an effort, a long effort to try to get to the truth. And what should happen is somebody should say, here's the data, here's the information. He shouldn't have to wait until becoming a whistleblower to get that information. Mr. Uh, Jacobson, uh, you worked at the FAA for quite a while. Mr. Pearson and as well Mr. Salapur have been critical, as many of us have been, of the FAA. Uh, in fact, Mr. Pearson has brought to the attention of federal authorities information about the potential failings of those investigative steps by federal agencies. Uh, do you think just assigning more inspectors to Boeing from the FAA is a sufficient solution? Well, certainly um, having more uh, inspectors is helpful in certain circumstances. I think um, in, the, in the Renton factory, having more inspectors, uh, more of an on-site presence is very important. Uh, but the attitude needs to change. Um, the attitude right now is Boeing dictates to the FAA uh, tells the FAA what they will do, what they will accept, and that needs to change. Uh, the FAA needs to be a regulator. Uh, they need to do their job, and, th and that's the missing piece right now. Would it be fair to say that the FAA has been too captive to Boeing? They, they absolutely have been too captive to Boeing, um, and, and that is one of, the, one of the big problems that I've seen. Even when we were trying to recertify the 737 MAX, um, Boeing would try and focus the attention on certain things like MCAS to the exclusion of other uh, parts of the airplane or the design or the manufacturing that needed to be investigated. And, and Boeing or, and the FAA went along with that at high levels. They went along with that, you know, the, the redirect from, from the Boeing company. Uh, Mr. Salapur, I showed you earlier a photograph of a tire wheel from your car. Uh, that bolt was inserted by someone as a threat, perhaps as a risk to you. Yes, I was losing just air on my tire, and I bring it somewhere, and they say, hey, you have a nail in tire. That's about one month old tire. So I brought it back to the shop that they fixed it. And uh, they fixed it. I went to pick it up, and the gentleman told me that you know, this nail was not picked up through normal driving. You know, I didn't know anything about that. He's the one who brought it to my attention. And I came home, and I had to go all the way back there to get the tire, to just save the tire. It was like 25-mile drive. But anyway, what the bottom line is that, yes, the nail was inserted in there. I believe it happened at work. I have no proof of that. You mentioned also a threat to your physical safety. Someone saying, they "Yes, would have someone, you if they someone heard. told me they're going to kill. They would have killed someone like me if you said something, what you said." So, 
Uh, the FAA issued an absolutely scathing report about Boeing, and Boeing has said that it's developing an action plan. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Pearson, should we rely on Boeing to, in effect, develop its own action plan, evaluate itself, and go on about its business? Or do we need continuing investigation? We absolutely need continuing investigation. And honestly, I'm so tired of hearing about plans. We need action. And, and you know, you can plan all day long, but if you don't actually carry through with it, it doesn't matter. You'd like to see action. Yes, sir. I think that's one of the common themes here. We need action, not just more talk. I'm going to uh, yield at this point. We're observing a seven-minute round, and uh, we're going to try to stick to it. Uh, Senator Johnson. So l let me point out, I think it's the 800-pound grill in the room is the tremendous pressure society-wide to keep these planes flying. I mean, if, if we were to literally ground stop 737s, what, what, what would happen to our economy? That's, again, that's why we don't even like contemplating that reality. But I want to start focusing on the 737 because that's the one issue. You've got the 787, then you have the, the subcontractors, from my standpoint, the three, and then the overall culture of, of Boeing. But th there's a discrepancy between uh, our two witnesses here. <clears throat> Mr. Pearson, you're, you're, you were saying that it's, it was a manufacturing defect. And Mr. Jacobson, you're focusing on the MCAS, which is what the public was all told. It was that control system. And with, with only a single indicator that if that went defective. Uh, so again, th that was the story told. What is the truth? I mean, Ms. We'll start with you, Mr. Jacobson. Well, the truth is it's, it's more than one thing, right? It's, it's the entire system. You have to look at manufacturing. You have to look at um, also at the design. Um, since the MAX has gone back into service, th this is the list of manufacturing. These are unsafe conditions that are identified by the FAA in the manufacturing area. Um, engine anti-ice, exhaust duct, duct fasteners, compromised seal and adhesion within the center fuel tank, loose bolts in the rudder assembly, stuck rudder pedals, misinstalled electrical wire, wire bundles in the wing spoilers, and then of course the door blowout was also a manufacturing defect. So we have a long list of unsafe conditions from manufacturing defects, we also have a long list, equally long list, of design defects. So what that tells me is um, it's a company-wide problem. It's not So the, the MAX was taken out of service for how long? Quite some time, right? 20 months. 20, 20 months. And again, the public, you know, I was certainly hoping, assuming that that 20 months uh, they were able to correct those defects, that they did install more of the indicators, right? So they, they somewhat fixed that problem? I mean, are all these other problems completely unaddressed, not well, there, fixed? There, there were many problems that were unaddressed. The crew alerting system is, is the big one. Um, that one was not addressed. That contributed to the crashes. The pilots had a lot of uh, false indications going off, which delays their response, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, in the meantime, you know, um, the stabilizer is running and the, the nose is running down. So um, it's, it's a combination of so things that need to be what, what, addressed. What, what do the pilots have to say about this? I mean, one of my things that comfort me is that, you know, pilots are concerned about safety. They're, they do some safety checks even before they get on the airplane, but they're the ones that have to fly these things. They're, they're, what do pilots have to say about the 737 MAX right now? Well, um, you know, I, I've heard some reports. Um, you know, Dennis Tazier has been very vocal. He's an American Airlines MAX pilot, uh, also works with us at the Foundation for Aviation Safety. He's been very vocal about the shortcomings of the MAX. Um, does he fly them? He does. So and, he's, and he still flies them? He still flies them. And he says, why is Boeing putting all these extra hazards into my cockpit? Uh, it's a big enough job. To, to fly this airplane and take care of the passengers in the back. I don't need extra problems to be dealing with like manufacturing defects, design defects, and they're one after another. There's a long list that I've put in my written Mr. Pearson, do you have anything to add to that on the 737? No, I, I totally agree with Mr. Jacobson. Um, you know, when they investigated the accidents, they 
narrowly scoped it and they kept it very tight. And as an example of that, um, when the plane was returned to service, the MAX airplanes were returned to service, they um, said that they fixed the MCAS software and they provided the pilots the training that they needed. And then they said, we fixed some wiring, uh, but it was unrelated to the accidents. Well, a couple months ago, we, we found the service bulletin that was sent out to the airlines to fix some wiring. That document was 343 pages long. It identified at least 12 areas on the airplane that had improper electrical insulation. And I will tell you that when those planes were being built, we were having repeat problems getting our functional testing done correctly. And this is something that we continued to push and push and push the planes out the door, and we were having difficulty getting our aircraft systems testing. What people don't know, and I'll just give you a couple of examples very quickly, is in the Lion airplane, that sensor, that angle of attack sensor, was removed the day before, replaced with the refurbished sensor. On the next flight, the plane almost crashed. On the next flight, it did crash. When that plane hit the ocean, it went right to, into the seawall. They never recovered that sensor that was just installed but they had the original Boeing installed sensor and they tested that sensor and it had an open circuit in it. It had evidence of arcing and burn marks. And so that, um, that is an example. And then okay, this, I've, and I've, I'm I've, just I've, pointing that out that it, this it's is- getting, That's getting a level of detail right now. I don't have, I'm okay. fine, appreciate that. Um, again, I, I'll, I'll keep, this shows you Mr. Chairman what we need to get the airlines in here whether they want to or not, they have to come in here and talk about what they're doing in response to these technical bulletins. We need to get pilots in here. We need, we need to talk to pilots, because from my standpoint, they're almost the last line in, of defense in terms of safety from, from the flying public, because they're on that, I, I would never get on a plane that's autonomous, never. Senator, I just I echo what you're saying, but I think we also need to broaden that aperture. We need to talk to the mechanics and oh, the I technicians agree. and all those individuals. No, again, yes, as, you, as you said in your testimony, five, five minutes testimony doesn't even, be, even begin to scratch the surface. Hour and a half hearing doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. This, that's why I said. This needs to be an in-depth investigation. There's a lot of elements to this thing. Uh, in preparing for this, I, I did listen to one NBC News report, and the, this is on the 787 on this gap, and they, they were reporting that, that Boeing had apparently stress tested a plane, 165,000 takeoffs and landings, which is three times normal life. They inspected 689 of the 1,100 planes that are in service, zero evidence of fatigue. So how am I supposed to interpret that? Well, I think Boeing tries to put a lot of uh, misinformation out there. The problem is that 165,000 was on the original airplane. It did not see the excessive forces that we're talking about. If you haven't done the excessive force on those planes, they just thrown that out there to muddy up the water so that information is so clogged up that they are not. You know, they're saying they've done 40,000 tests or whatever. You know, did they put the information out there under what circumstances, what airplanes, what was the situation? None of that is shared. I have asked Mrs. Fall you know, Lisa Fall that it was on that thing two months ago, three months ago, when I met her, I said, hey, you know, I'm gonna complain, I'm complaining to her about the 787. She said, I'll have somebody get you the information. You probably haven't seen the information. I have not seen any information whatsoever. Okay. As a matter of fact, you know, like they're just throwing that stuff. If you wanna change the information, like the 165,000, then you need to rerun that test with 165,000, with the new excessive force, and show that it's good. Yeah, you got to show you. Or just one, one quick question for Mr. Pearson. You said you had uh, uh, delivered records to the FBI. First of all, how did you how did you uh, obtain those records? And have you heard back from the FBI? The records were sent to me, um, and from, from an internal whistleblower. From an internal whistleblower and I provided those records to the FBI. And again, you know, for the last couple months, there's been, you know, talk that there's, there's no records, and that's and, and obviously this, not this the This is on case. the Alaskan Airlines This is on the Alaska that, Airlines. That, that Boeing apparently overwrote the video that would have shown, again, I, I've talked to Boeing, they said that's just normal, it's a 30-day cycle, and it's mainly, it's not really, the video's not there to document the maintenance would really document other things potentially, but it's overwritten regularly. Yeah, I'm talking about the actual documentation that they've been saying has not been available. It is available. It is available in the FBI. And it, ha and it has been available for months. 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, uh, Senator Johnson. We're going to go to uh, Senator Marshall, then Senator Hassan, and Senator Hawley. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Salapur, you've described several significant events since you came forward with your claims. One was the nail in the tire. You described your life was being threatened. Do you feel that this style of retaliation against you has been part of Boeing's efforts to silence and prevent you from sharing your story? I think the retaliation, somebody even was calling me on my personal phone, you know, time after time. You know, this is my personal phone, you know. Well, what were they saying? Or Well, my boss was calling me there, and uh, for 40 minutes, he kind of berated me and chewed me out. I have a work phone that he can use, but he's calling you on your personal phone, and it reminds me of you know, people who they stalk people or something like that, they call you on your personal phone to let you know that they know where you live, they know where you are, and they can hurt you. And, you know, after the threats and after this, you know, it's like, you know, it really scares me, believe me. But I am at peace. You know, if something happens to me, I am at peace because I feel like by coming forward, I will be saving a lot of lives, and I'm at peace. Whatever happens, it happens. Well, we certainly do appreciate you, you coming forward and, and certainly the brave and, and courage it takes for all of you to do this. Yeah. Do you think that there was a culture of retaliation against whistleblowers at Boeing? It, absolutely. And also, there is a culture of when you address the quality issues, and that's all I have done. I haven't made it personal. All I've done is said, hey, you know, we are not measuring the gaps properly. We are not shimming the gaps properly. Then, you know, you get threat, threatened and this and that. All I'm trying to say is that system needs to be changed. Do you still have your job? I have my job. The only reason I have my job because I had my attorneys. We filed for the whistleblower system before I spoke up this time. What's it like when you go back to work? Well, uh, last time, uh, if you can think of it, I went to a meeting on the 777, and I brought up my concern in that meeting to say that the way we build in that airplane, it does not uh, correlate to what the design of the airplane is. Because of that, we are resulting in a lot of misfares, you know, uh, misfares and a lot of problems. You know, after 300 plus airplanes, we should be able to make that airplane. And uh, my boss sent somebody to the meeting, pulled me out of the meeting, and uh, called me on the phone and says, I throw the person under the bus by asking the question, what are we doing to make our design compatible with our build system to overcome these, you know, mislocated holes and this and that. And then he says, what was that my intention, you know, and uh, really braided me and a week later, he was going to talk about that again. I thought, you know, it's, it's resolved, but a week later, he was talking to me about that. You know, why should you even be pr prosecuted for something that, you know, all you're doing is saying, hey, the design that we used to have, we went to determine an assembly, right. it's not working. What so, can we do? Have you guys thought about anything to bring that so that they are compatible? So you, your intention was to build a safe airplane? Absolutely. Yeah. Not with force. <laughs> I, w I want to try to understand this uh, okay. the diagram that you all yeah. supplied us. This is a Boeing 787. 7, 7. Yes. And you're talking about where these joints come together. Yes. I'm talking about the one on the fo most forward between, yeah, right there, and one in the aft. That's a 4143. No, the one this way. This yeah, one. Right. Between that, that one. and the, the nose. That's a 4143. It's a major joint. And then one on the aft. So in, instead of shimming them, they're basically just using force to bring them together. And you're absolutely. concerned that it hurts the composite. Well, it, and it just violates every one of our common practices. Okay. Because you don't force the stuff together. Because when you force the stuff together, you increase the stress concentration right. on that. If you think, think of a paper clip, if you bend it back Get and it. forth, after a little while, it breaks. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of, of action, that's what I want to talk next about is, is action. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with NIAR at Wichita State University, the National Institute of Aviation Research. 
They specialize in aerospace R&D, including composite advanced materials, and they do wind tunnel, t wind tunnel testing, where they would take an entire wing, an entire fuselage from a plane like this and stress test it. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, would you, do you feel like that type of stress? I want to get the, we, we have different opinions, but that's where I would have confidence, and America would have confidence if there was stress testing, take some of these randomly and, and do that stress testing, or maybe it's already been done, I don't know. Well, I'm not a structure specialist, um, so I, I can't really comment on the, on the details of any of those sort of, um, you know, hypotheticals. But, I mean, in general, um, all of this, there's, there's design, then there's testing, there's, there's quite a process, and you can't violate any part of that process. If you violate... Um, okay, thank, I'm sorry, but is anybody else familiar with NIOR and that type of stress testing where you put them in, do wind tunnel testing on these? I, I just think that that's the action that I would have confidence in as a scientist who have tested thousands of jets and airplanes uh, and are experts in composite to see exactly if this is a, a challenge or not. I think that would be a great... A great uh, answer to this question. That's action. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Salford. Well, one, one thing that I want to, you know, the issue that we're talking about is pressurizing the fuselage from the inside. Okay. You know, when you pressurize and depressurize, basically, you know, that's, we call a fly cycle. Every time you go up and you come down, that's one flight cycle. I'm sure that we can reproduce that at NIAR. So I think it's a great, great yeah. point, though. And yeah. lastly, my last question is, it feels like the FAA and the DOT has dropped the ball as well here, though. M Mr. Pearson, go ahead. And, th and this the, is the action. The, I'm it's sorry, the, it was the DOT and the... And FAA. The, uh, uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, people don't understand. The FAA is a subordinate agency to the Department of Transportation. And as the FAA has been struggling with re revolving leadership and everything else, there's been numerous opportunities for the Department of Transportation to get involved and engaged. And what we've seen from them is nothing. They just kind of are on the sidelines. So, so to me, the action would be to ask the staff to sit down with the FAA and the DOT and the people and, and, and some type of report. We can't bring them in here for another six-hour hearing, but I would love to see a little bit more report on, on how they would defend themselves. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, if I could just add, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt, but um, we met with the head of the FAA and, and the deputy of uh, Secretary of Transportation and in March 8th, our foundation did, and we met with them, and we went through 35 um, problems, and we made recommendations to each one, and we said we would offer to assist whatever we could because we want them to be successful. Um, but they need to get in the game is all I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Marshall. Uh, I might just point out we've been in touch with the FAA. We hope that they will appear at a hearing as well, and they've issued a scathing report detailing the findings of an expert panel review of Boeing's management practices. Uh, the panel found, for example, quote, a lack of awareness of safety-related metrics at all levels of the organization, end quote. So I'm hoping that the FAA will be cooperative and aggressive in our continuing investigation as well. Uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much, Chair Blumenthal and Ranking Member Johnson, uh, for holding the hearing today. Uh, thank you to all of our witnesses for appearing today, uh, as well as your commitment to aviation safety and protecting the public. Uh, to Chris and Clarice Moore, um, thank you for being here. I am so sorry for your loss. Um, the picture of your daughter is a reminder of the reason we're here today and why aviation safety is so important. So thank you for being here. Um, and to Mr. Salapur, you mentioned in your testimony, as I understand it, that the Challenger disaster was a wake-up call as, and an example of why safety is so important. The teacher who was lost in that disaster was Krista McAuliffe from Concord, New Hampshire, and her loss is still felt today, as is her example. Uh, so um, thank you for um, invoking her memory today. Uh, and I wanted to start with a question to you, Mr. Salapur, and apologies if some of this has been covered uh, because we are in and out, but um, 
as a whistleblower, you raised two safety concerns regarding quality controls during the manufacturing and assembly process. Can you describe the internal Boeing culture around reporting safety and quality concerns? Right now, basically, you know, I have very, I guess, negative attitude towards the quality concern. You know, when I bring something to my boss to say, you know, we have problems with this, and he prevents me from even documenting and prevents me from even sending the information to the Shmi's, you know, the subject matters experts, to me that's a problem. You know, a quality manager telling you not to write your concerns and not to send it to the uh, you know, the subject matter expert to just, let's say, you know, I'm, I don't know for sure. You know, they, they close a gap of like three quarters of an inch without shim. You know, right. that's concerning. Yeah. Our r rules are zero one oh. So I said, you know, I want to write that. Well, don't send it. So not only were you discouraged and really told not to document it, what's your impression of how comfortable other Boeing personnel are with raising their concerns to management, both before and after you came forward? Well, I think it's very negative. It's, it's really, they think that, you know, like we had a situation where they had debris in the, in the gap, yep. and my, my friend put some inspections in there, and the, the boss was telling them that, you know, are you trying to stop the production? You know, those are significant problems that, you know, if you don't inspect, you have to inspect to get a good quality airplanes out. Right. And what I'm trying to say is the attitude at Boeing from the highest level is just to push the defective parts regardless of what it is, unfortunately. So what you're really saying is if, so from the top down, people are discouraged from coming forward. Uh, and so people are quite reluctant um, to come forward I in this culture. Absolutely. And, you know, the fact that I asked for the data from, I, I complained to Mrs. Fall, you know, and uh, she said she'll have somebody send me the information on 787. To this date, I haven't received any. Okay. So uh, another question for you, sir. In 2020, Congress reformed safety and certification requirements for aircraft manufacturers following the 737 MAX disasters. What was your experience with how those reforms were implemented and whether Boeing appropriately followed them? My personal opinion from what I've seen from bottom up, it's been nothing. Okay. And Mr. Jacobson, as a former FAA official, do you have any thoughts about how effective that agency was in implementing and overseeing those reforms? The attitude from day one was, was not good at the upper levels of the FAA. The message that I heard right after AXA was passed was, uh, we're already doing all of this. So that's the wrong attitude from day one. Mm -hmm. And then what I saw, I tracked a lot of the implementation of AXA, uh, working with Senator Cantwell's office. And what I saw there was um, kind of a half-hearted, uh, look at all of these recommendations and, and requirements. Um, they tended to lump them all together yeah. and called them work streams and said, we've got that covered. That's in this work stream or that work stream. And instead of taking each individual provision very seriously and attacking them, that, that was not the attitude. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question to both Mr. Pearson and then again to Mr. Jacobson. You both raised concerns about the 737 MAX, one of you directly with Boeing and the other with the FAA. Given the safety failures that have led us to this hearing, how can Congress better empower whistleblowers, protect them from retaliation, and reestablish a willing adherence to safety standards? So we'll start with you, Mr. Pearson. As I said, Senator, um, you know, we really shouldn't have to rely on whistleblowers. But with that said, I think that uh, all these um, programs need to have much more oversight because what happens, for example, at right now, if a Boeing employee wants to submit a whistleblower report to the FAA, they submit a hotline report. And those hotline reports go in, and then it could take months, potentially, for them to investigate it. And sometimes we've been told that uh, they don't, employees don't really know what happened. 
And so I think that there's a lot more, it needs to be a lot more attention. And, and again, I, I think what we need to talk about is leadership at all levels, uh, not just at the senior leader level, but even at the very frontline level, we need to treat people with respect and we need to value these employees. And I think that will help a long way. I, I think we're not providing enough training to these employees. I know that in the factory and we're putting individuals in responsible jobs and they need a lot more training. And I think that will help a long way of preventing having to use whistleblowers. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Yeah, I'm hopeful that uh, Mr. Whitaker, the new FAA administrator, will will really take on the challenge of changing the culture at the FAA so that FAA is back to doing their job as a regulator. Um, if if they just rubber stamp everything that the you know the manufacturers do, then it's really um, they're not doing anything useful. And so we need to get back to them doing a useful job as regulators. Thank you for that. And um, Dr. Pushniki, I have a question for you, but I am out of time, so I will submit it for the record. I'm just really looking for your recommendations about how to eliminate these grave safety risks. So we'll submit that for the record. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Hassan. Senator Hawley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for convening this hearing. Thanks to each of the witnesses for being here. Mr. Salapur, let me just start with you. I just want to back up and make sure I understand your testimony, because it seems extraordinary to me. And I'm reading the letters that you've submitted from your attorney when you first contacted uh, the FAA, when you contacted the committee. So my understanding is you worked on both the 787 and the 777, correct? Yes, sir. And you identified major safety concerns with both of these lines, so yes, say. Sir. And you, identify, you identified these to your superiors. Yes, sir. I have written many memos time after time that we ha we can provide. Over a period of years, I think. Uh, yeah, this is like three years. For the 777, I mean 787, it's been three years of effort. And so your concerns, how who knew about your concerns? How far up the, the chain do you know that they went? I have gone as high as Mark Stockton and Lisa Fall, who's the vice president. The vice president of the company? So they, they were and are aware of, of these major safety concerns. And this is what, this is what you do for a living. I mean, you're, you're an engineer, right? I mean, I'm an engineer. I went to quality about three, four years ago. And when you put your quality hat, we are the eyes and ears of the public for the safety of the airplane. That's how I feel about our job. And so I have, you know, when I see concerning information or concerning uh, uh, um, let's say, production issues, then it is our responsibility to make sure that, you know, if we are causing the airplane to have increased risk factors, our job is to eliminate those risk factors. It, are these planes safe? Right now, I would not. You know, it's like an earthquake. You know, it, the big earthquake is coming, but when... When that hits, the building that you know you, let's say if you're talking of a building, have to be prepared to uh, accommodate that type of a, let's say, shakeup. You know, it has to be built properly. Right now, from what I've seen, the airplanes are not being built per spec and per requirement. So you th your testimony is the 787 line and the 777, the 777 line, are, are you think are not. Or well, they, they are doing stuff that increases the risk factors, okay? When you increase the risk factors, you know, it's not just one. You are doing stress concentrations that those stress concentrations, like, you know, breaking a, a paper clip, you know, you do it once or twice, it doesn't break, but it breaks at some time. As the plane gets older, you know, all of these things that, you know, you took, you know, you said it's not a safety issue, it becomes a safety issue. And the company's response to you was to threaten you? Threaten you, sideline you, you know, transfer you. You raised concerns about the 787, and so they transferred you, transferred you to the 777, right? Well, in, yes. Initially, they just cut me off of all the meetings. Ah. They took my name out. And then so I was just doing nothing. I wasn't informed of what. Then they transferred me. And they do it pretty stealthy. Oh, we have a job over here. We want you to go over there. So they move you down there. And, you know, I come from like 40 years of engineering background. So when I see, pro and I've taken a lot of stress, class, stress classes, even though I'm not a specialist on that, but when there's a problematic area that you see, you can recognize. So, so they, I just want to make sure I get the sequence right. So... 
You raise these concerns, you get on the 787, you get transferred, or transferred over to the 777, you raise the concerns there, they ignore it in both, they, they haven't addressed any of these concerns, is that your testimony? Yes, sir. And at, one point, at some point they start to threaten you. You're talking about your, your boss calling you on your personal phone yeah. and, and berating you, and when did that start? Well, that started right after when I said, you know, we have made over 300 plus airplanes. We still don't know how to put the load and sell. What, what I mean by that, you know, if you build in an airplane, I mean, build in a house, it's like, you know, put in the foundation. You know, we have made over 300 airplanes. We still changing our process, like build the foundation to put the airplanes. We are struggling with that because they have changed the process you know, from stable to unstable situation. They're not building the, the same datums that we were building, so you're causing your own problem, but you don't want to admit it. Just force fit the problem, you know, force fit the misaligned holes and everything else, and move on. And that's what they have been doing. And that's what I have brought up to their attention. I told my boss that I said in the, in the report, I said, we have made 300 plus airplanes. That should have been more than adequate for us to resolve these things. All the problems that we've had, we put Band-Aid over Band-Aid to resolve the problems, and Band-Aid over Band-Aid doesn't cover it. Maybe we need to consider some engineering fundamentals with a little bit of GDNT to figure out what the problem is. And right after that, he came back to my desk, and he, he like I said, you know, he made the threat, and then after that, he says, are you in or are you out? What Meaning what? Are you in and are you out with Boeing? I mean, are you going to be a good good citizen and keep your mouth shut? Was well, that the implication? Well, that, that's how I can, I can interpret that. He would walk by me and he said, you better, then he said, I want you to write it in writing. Tell me, are you in or are you out? Put we it have, in writing whether or not you were going to. I'm were gonna, in or out. And what that means, are you going to just shut up? Right. Well, that's only that would be I, in. If you wanted to be in, you needed to be quiet. You needed to stop this. You know, don't don't say anything more. Certainly, don't tell the public. Uh, that's how I interpret it. But he told me to write it in writing, and I'm trying to write it. And um, there was ten emails, just because I haven't received your email on this. Send it to me, and this and that. So then he's pressuring you. I mean, then you've he's got to... pressuring you, and then. His manipulation even got further than that. You know, like, yeah, I'm trying to take a class on my own time that I have to flex the time. He wouldn't let me do that. Oh. You know, I'm trying, I have a doctor's appointment. He cancels my doctor appointment at oh. the same day. I mean, you know, different, manipulating different behavior. things to retaliate, to make your life miserable. And then, you know, I started talking to go somewhere else. You know, I, I mean, you know, you... You, you just try to escape from that because this is hell, you know, that I was yes. subjected to. And then he threatens you with that. And uh, really, with my background, you know, I've had some, uh, um, you know, it it's really has made me where 3 o'clock in the morning I'm waking up with somebody stabbing me. You know, I'm still receiving psychological help to just get back on normal. Well, it, it is... It is unbelievable to me that in the midst of this safety crisis at this corporation, that what they're doing is threatening their own engineers, whose job it is to help identify potential safety concerns. And rather than saying, you know what, you've got a point. We need to maybe do something about this. They're telling you to hide it. They're reassigning you. They're threatening you. They're trying to shut you up. In the meantime, I noticed this guy, Dave Calhoun. I think he's the CEO. I guess he's leaving at the end of the year. I wonder how much he's getting paid. I bet it's a lot. Yes. I it's bet a lot it's, more than my pay grade. I bet it's a lot more than your paycheck. Yeah. I bet it's a heck of a lot. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you for, for holding this hearing. I, I think we're just scratching the surface here, but this is just, this is extraordinary. It's just extraordinary. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Giving uh, us the opportunity. Thank you very much, Senator Hawley. And again, I just want to say uh, I could not agree more with the points that have been made about the need for continuing investigation by our subcommittee as well as by the FAA and the Department of Justice. Um, and I'm anticipating we'll have strong bipartisan consensus about the next steps that we will take. But uh, we're going to have a, another round of questioning. It's going to be short, shorter than I would like, because we have a deadline for being in our chairs in the United States Senate on the floor for a completely unrelated purpose, uh, but I want to kind of begin where 
to Senator Hawley ended, Mr. Sal Mr. Salpour, uh, in your testimony, you told us that since 2021, multiple colleagues have told you about sharing your concerns. Most of them have not come forward. Why? It's the fear. I mean, if you think of how much problem I have created, you know, by coming up with my, you know, being persistent about talking about the defects and everything else. Ever since the space shuttle O-rings, that has really put a mark on me. That thing should not have happened, but it happened because of the faulty engineering. And that's exactly what we have here, is we have faulty engineering that, you know, they're trying to shove on our throats to just say, hey, you know, whatever we do, it's okay. From one side, they put reports that it says it's not okay. From other side, when they violate it, they try to while whitewash the influence. Whitewashing, and become, whitewashing, the whitewashing the spec to say it's not important for this thing. You know, this spec, if we don't meet it, it's not that big of a deal. Let's just push the airplanes out. And then the, the, the attitude of the people for, like I said, you know, not being receptive, you know, because of the threats or anything else, be, that's because of that people haven't come forward. You know, you've been very careful in the way that you have phrased the potential danger here. You talked about the increased risk. Yes. One could compare it to something a little bit like Russian roulette. We never know exactly when it's going to happen, when or where or how it's going to happen, but fatigue building and the potential vulnerability of that fuselage to tearing apart is a risk that has been increased. And it's a risk that should never have been increased. Absolutely. And yet these processes are continuing, are they not? Yes, sir. From what I know, it's continuing. And right now, Boeing is coming back and really Remember, whatever they put out there, they say that you know, everything is OK, because they never learn from their mistakes. That's what the really significant thing that I want to take from this is that they never learn. You know, it's like a lie. When you say one lie, you have to lie 10 more times to cover that lie. You know, hey, we made a mistake. Let's correct it and move on. But that's not what's happening. Um, you've referred to numerous memos that you've written. Uh, I have one of them, which is a 2021 memo. Uh, the recipient of it has been deleted, but the memo speaks volumes, in my view. And one part of it, one sentence, I think, is kind of a coda for the lesson that Boeing should have learned, and I'm quoting, kicking me out of the program because I am raising safety concerns over the unintended consequences of the increased fit-up forces and potential escapements as a result does not help anybody. It does not help anybody. It doesn't help Boeing. No. At all. And again, this focus on stock price, on quarterly profit, on money over safety is a bad investment. It is malpractice beyond simply a broken self safety culture. Uh, the, the expert panel of the FAA said something that I thought was uh, pretty telling, quote, a safety culture is not something that springs up ready-made from near-death experience. Rather, it emerges gradually from the persistent and successful application of practical and down-to-earth measures, like giving you a bonus for your courage and your insights, rather than, in effect, threatening and penalizing you. Yes, sir. Dr. Puchnicki, am I correct in that kind of observation 
about safety culture, that it has to be the result of persistent, step-by-step, -step, down to earth actions by management that is really committed to safety, not just in word, but in deed, and it has to put its money where its mouth is. No, you're exactly right. Uh, and this is part of the four parts of a safety culture, that you do have these reward systems in place, and you are proud when people come forward like this, and you embrace that and you celebrate that. And there's many different ways you can do that. Uh, various companies can, can, can do this. But if, if I may take this time to just add one thing very quickly, is one part of a healthy safety culture is that the accountability goes all the way to the top of the, uh, of the company, all the way to the CEO. And when I go to help companies um, with their safety culture problems, I, I talk all to, to, to CEOs. And one of the questions I ask them is, how much time do you spend weekly with your safety department? Because different companies might spend time with their marketing people, their finance people, and, and all their money people. And what I find across the board is, they don't spend time with their safety people, yet they say they're accountable and they sign documents they're accountable. And most of the time they'll tell me, well, my, uh, this person meets with them or, or whomever. That is not accountability to the top. And I tell them that, well, if you have time to meet with marketing and your finance people, then you should have time to meet with your safety people weekly. And if I had time to talk to Boeing, I'd be fascinated to know how many times per week their CEO people actually talk to their safety people. That shows accountability. It would be an interesting answer to that question. So deans of business schools across the country and CEOs of corporations, big and small, are you listening? Will yeah. you take a lesson from Boeing's experience? Yeah, because if they're not doing this, they're wrong. Flat out, and we've seen this time and time again with accidents, and I go all over the world and I help companies straighten this out. It's flat out. I, I'm gonna yield to uh, Senator Johnson. So, so let me just underscore, you know, from my own manufacturing background, I think the key to a safety system, quality system is accountability. You know, my little plastics manufacturing plant, every roll of plastic that went out had the operator's name on the name tag, on the roll tag. We, if that was rejected, we knew exactly who Produce that who approved it. And so, so accountability is, is crucial, which takes me back to the 737 MAX and the deferred prosecution agreement. First of all, I, I want some clarity. Was it or was it not the, the MCAS system that caused that crash? The MCAS system, uh, Senator, was obviously played a significant role, so did the lack of pilot training. But as Mr. Jacobson has said, there was other factors, and our analysis, my analysis, shows that those airplanes also had manufacturing defects that triggered the MCAS software. Mr. Jacobson? Yeah. So what were those other defects? I mean, was it the, the, the sensor? I mean, only having one sensor was part of that system, though, but... Well, the sensor... Um, as, as Mr. Pearson has talked about, the sensor showed um, problems. The original sensor on the Lion Air airplane showed uh, a lot of manufacturing defects when it was examined. Um, what I found curious was after the Ethiopian crash, they said the sensor was taken off by a bird. They had no evidence for that, none whatsoever, but they concluded that it was the bird that did it. And so I... I think it's much more plausible and likely that it was a electrical fault of some t sort, either arcing or something like that. So of, of all the troubling testimony uh, that I've read here, leading up to this hearing what I've heard here today, uh, probably the most troubling is the fact that Boeing did not notify regulators of this significant change in the MCAS system. And would you agree with that? I would. Um, I, I think the, both crashes would not have happened if they had been fully transparent and forthcoming with the design. Um, of, so we, of we, the come back, we come back to accountability. Yes. Has anybody been held accountable for concealing that from the FAA? I mean, 300 some lives were lost. And again, my condolences to those family members of those lives were lost. This, this was beyond negligence. Th this is an overt act. And nobody has been held 
accountable in any way, shape, or form, financially, losing their job, criminally held liable? Look, we've been dancing around an issue here that, quite frankly, being a systems engineer, I design a lot of automation and the interaction between human and automation. And what they did is quite obvious. They snuck the MCAS system through the certification process. Period. It's that simple. Is, is, and, and, is, and they, is, but they did that over money, is, sir. Is that or was that criminal? Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I, a, I I'm not a prosecutor. Is that... Is that criminal? Do we have laws in the books? The, I can't that, answer that. That type of that type of uh, I, I evade, what's the right word? Like not evasion. I mean, is that was that criminal behavior? Should somebody been held liable criminally? I can't answer if that's criminal, but as a cognitive engineer, I can tell and I, and, I, and I know how the certification process works, and I know how this accident works. They snuck it through the process, and it was all about money. It was all about getting those airplanes to Southwest, and it was all about money, and that's why those people died. Has the deferred prosecution agreement been made public, or is that I, sealed? I'm not aware if it's been made it has, or not. It has been made public, uh, Senator, and it, it's an absolute, um, probably the most embarrassing thing in my career if I've seen is, is how those families were treated, and that deferred prosecution agreement should never have happened. It's, it was absolutely criminal that they did that, it was, it was, it was just so, hard so, so who's in charge of that deferred that is, prosecution? That I mean, is, that who, is, who agreed to that? That's the Department of Justice. Uh, that let me just intervene since I am a former United States attorney and a federal prosecutor. Uh, the Department of Justice deferred prosecution agreement is public. In fact, I was very critical of it at the time it was reached. And I've urged since then that the Department of Justice investigate whether, in fact, it has been violated. And I think the ranking member raises a very pertinent and important question. Uh, Mr. Pearson has raised it as well. He's presented evidence that the Department of Justice should consider through the FBI. Uh, we have brought to the Department of Justice's attention evidence that should be considered. Uh, they're going to have to make a judgment. We can't because we're not prosecutors. But accountability. And, that, and that's and, and that important. is the reason I'm going down this line of questioning is accountability all along the process, you know, within the company, then the, their quality system, their top management, but then the FAA, and then Department of Justice when they see the evidence, not doing anything about it, and and again I'll, I'll go back to the reality of the fact that we all want Boeing to succeed, that that we don't want to think that there are conditions in these planes that w should really force regulators to ground these planes, what that would do to our economy, what that would do to people's lives. I mean, that's, that's just a reality. It's an, off, it's an awful reality, but that's what we're all facing. I think that's what's driving the lack of accountability. People want to be held accountable because people don't want to take the actions that might be required here. I, 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 I think Senator, that's just an awful reality. I just want to emphasize again that the airlines play a huge role in this, right? They obviously want airplanes. They, they need airplanes to do their, you know, what they want to do. But they have a, a very much a um, responsibility to make sure those planes are safe. I'll just give you an example. We did an analysis and in Alaska Airplanes. We did it. We produced this. Pub, we published this thing in September 2023. They had 53 brand new MAX airplanes. We found over 1,200 aircraft system malfunction reports that they had submitted to the FAA, 1,200 on 53 brand new planes within two years old. And I'm not talking tray tables or headrests. I'm talking the systems that Mr. Jacobson has been talking about. So we need to make sure that those things are investigated and resolved, and, and they're which, supposed to be. Which is why I've reached out to the airlines. I've talked to a couple CEOs. Um, we need to talk to their pilots. We need to get their mechanics. We need all these people talking together. Uh, just individual hearings aren't going to do it. I mean, this, this requires a full-blown investigation with all these people being interviewed, uh, people feeling free they can come and they can come before us with whistleblower protection, either stay anonymous or provide whatever protection we can. Again, we need a lot of information. We need a lot of witnesses. We have an awful lot of information to uncover and discover here, a lot of truth to be exposed. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Let me uh, just conclude, and I would like to continue this hearing, but uh, Senator Johnson and I will be held accountable if we're not in our seats on the, on the floor of the United States Senate. 
uh, before 1 p.m. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you for being here for all the reasons that you know too well. You have taken risks throughout your career, every one of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, my, my colleague for his very understandably passionate and insightful comments, which I share about the need for accountability as a prosecutor. Accountability is about deterrence. It is about teaching lessons with real consequences for intentional mistakes and wrongdoing. And uh, I'm hopeful that we will be in touch with the Department of Justice to indicate our interest in cooperating with them. And in the meantime, uh, this record will remain open for 15 days for other questions that may be submitted in writing, and also documents that may be submitted by others. Uh, and we hope uh, that there will be others who will come forward. So uh, thank you all for being here today. This hearing is adjourned.